Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. My name is David Kirshner, and I have the uh, sad and solemn responsibility of officiating today as we say goodbye to an incredible wife, beloved mother, a trusted sister, an incredible grandmother, great grandmother, and a dear friend, and Madeline Satnik, Aleha Shalom of blessed memory. We're going to begin our service today as we begin all of our services and our tradition with the recitation of the 23rd Psalm. We pray that the recitation of the Psalm links the soul of Madeline to those who pray with you. Mis Morda David, Adonai Roi Lawachsar, Bino Deshe Yarbitseni, Almeimin of Fortunale, Nashi Yeshoved Yan Cheni Vamag Leitzedek Laman Shemo. Gam kielech begets a mavet, lo yorat ya kiatai madi, shiftacha, mishantacha, him in a hamuni. Tarok the funny shohan negates or ride, the shant of a shell and roshi cost you by ya. Ach to bachesed yurifuni call you mechayai, the shaft of the bait adonai, the orachami. A psalm of David, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me beside the still waters, he restores my spirit, for that is God's namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil because God is with us. God's rod and God's staff comfort us now and at all times. And even if you prepare a table in front of me, I know that my head is anointed with oil, that goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of God forever. Let us together say the words. Amen. Amen. Ronnie and Lauren, who amongst you is planning on speaking today? Okay, so let's begin with Ronnie. And then Hal, and then Lauren and Debbie. When you speak, you should take your masks off. And you got to be nice and loud so everyone can hear you, please. I want us to start off by uh, thanking the members of the Temple Emmanuel and Rabbi Kirshner for making this uh, virtual ceremony possible. Certainly appreciate the technology and the effort that you've made. In a strange way, COVID-19 has allowed many of our friends and family who might not have uh, physically been able to be here to be able to share this with us. And we thank all of you that are, that are watching and taking time to be with us um, for participating. I especially want to thank our caregivers, um, who my name are Juliet, Vilma, Remy, and MJ, and the office staff, the office staff of uh, Emily and Nick, who for the past several years have made our mother as comfortable as possible, given the health issues that she dealt with. Several years, um, my mother has been at the gate of death. And I was always concerned about trying to give her the proper farewell. And um, I know how she used to love to hear me give speeches when we had a wedding for our children. We would say, keep it short. And she would say, you talk as long as you want. I want to hear what you have to say. So I prepared a little something that I would like to read. A few years ago, during the high holidays at the, the Central Synagogue in the city, the rabbi gave a sermon that immediately struck a nerve that I'll never forget regarding my relationship with my mother. The theme of the sermon was the definition of the Hebrew word inani. The rabbi told the story of how throughout time, there were countless examples of challenges that God put forth to test the resolve of Jews. When Abraham heard the command by the burning bush to take his son to be sacrificed, his response was, Kineni, which meant in literal terms, here I am. When Moses was called upon to receive the Ten Commandments, his response was, Hineni, here I am. Several other examples were cited by the rabbi, all with the same message. Regardless of the task, the devoted person's response 
was always an eighty. There I am. And so it was with my mother. From as early as I can remember, my father instilled the concept that when tested, regardless of the outcome, as long as I tried my hardest, he would be proud of me. With that gauntlet, I never wanted to disappoint my mother or my father. And so I always felt I could work harder, study longer, and never stop trying to be better at whatever challenge I faced. Honestly, it drove me nuts to the point that I would study until the law of diminishing returns would set in or experience paralysis by analysis. I remember as a child, I would constantly ask my mother to test me on spelling, math, history, whatever the test was going to be the next day. And we would go late into the night and she would always wind up telling me, that's enough. You've studied as much as you're going to study. Go to sleep and do the best you can. I had no greater supporter, regardless of what challenge I had throughout my life. When I got married and we needed to have help watching our children, my mother was always there to display her form of Hineni. And when Lauren and any of our, my mother's grandchildren needed help, she was always there with Hineni. She was selfless, adoring, and yes, sometimes a pain in the ass. But her actions, whenever her name was called, was always Hineni. This became her greatest gift to me and a legacy I only hope to be able to fulfill for my children. So my thoughts today are simple. I hope that I never disappointed my mother and that as we lay her to rest alongside my sister and father, she feels my love and appreciation for all that she meant to me and my family. And Amy, we are all here. Since Saturday, I've been thinking and reflecting on my childhood and my family. Dad was a king and a tough guy. Mom was the queen and an elegant woman. Ronnie was the prince and had dad's ears. My sister Debbie, may she rest in peace, was a princess and a rebel. I was the baby, and as you can imagine, also a troublemaker. Throughout all the ups and downs of growing up, one thing was certain. Mom always protected me. That's how she was, no matter what the circumstances were. She always took care of us and loved us with her whole heart, and she had a special place for me. I'm starting to understand the way in which I take after my mom and how I've been influenced by her. Mom was an early riser. Maybe I didn't get that from her. But when I was a teenager, I used to go out to clubs and bars and the next morning after a night out, mom would come into my room, take the quilt off my bed, then the top sheet, remove my pillows while I was still in it. I'd say, mom, I'm still sleeping. She'd say, I'm making your bed. You can't imagine what a clean freak she was. She'd vacuum the house before the cleaning lady would come so she didn't know how dirty it was. She organized everything. For example, the only great thing about having a lot of orthoscopic surgeries was that mom was always there. And by the time I woke up, she managed to organize and color coordinate my closet, clean my kitchen, stock my fridge. Now living with my own family, especially being stuck in a house with eight people, the clean freak in me is even stronger. Mom worked a lot. She worked seven days a week, some days 12 hours a day. While she was great at work, she wasn't so great at cooking. She'd come home and make dinner, and while she's cooking, she'd call a friend to catch up. Needless to say, she'd lose track of time and burnt the food. That's why I started to cook. Thanks, Mom, for inspiring me to be such a good cook. She also always didn't agree with my decisions, like bringing a TV to work on Sundays when she and I would work together at the factory outlet. 
I'd watch the football games as I ran a cash register. And she'd always say, how can you concentrate on football and count money at the same time? Then one week, the giant game was on, and the score was tied with minutes to go. And a woman came up to my register and said to her husband, I'm ready. And her husband said, I want to watch the end of the game. Could you go please shop more? Mom never bothered me about bringing a TV into the store again. As I got older, my relationship with my parents shifted. Our roles changed. In 2011, after my dad died, I started to take care of my mom by delivering things to her and helping her around the house. Then in 2013, on our way home from a family trip, I rerouted to Miami because mom had a little kink in her intestines. I got her out of the hospital. I stayed with her in the house. I cooked, I cleaned, and of course, I filled her refrigerator. It was my chance to pay back and to take care of her and protect her after all the years that she had done that for me and my family. There's a book that Debbie and I used to read to our kids called I Love You Forever. It goes through a mother-son relationship through different stages of childhood. It starts with the son as an infant, then a toddler then a high schooler, a young adult, etc. Finally, the book ends with the son as a grown-up and the mother in her old age. As he puts his mother to sleep, he sings to her a rhyme she sang to him growing up. I love you forever. I like you for always. And as long as I'm living, my mother you'll be. Mom, I know you're up there with Dad and Debbie, and I hope Debbie's wearing a sweater. Lauren. So as usual, I'm a little disorganized here, but I was thinking last night and I was recalling conversations throughout the years that I've had with friends and family. And most of them would say, how's your mother-in-law doing? And I'm surprised she has survived this long with such an insidious disease. We would be remiss if we didn't mention why, which I am I covered in what I had written for you, but somebody who has gone through the misfortune that my mother-in-law has, and every time she would say to me, Laura, I don't think I can go on, but somehow she mustered up the strength to rally around for the people present who loved her dearly. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention her brother, Harvey, who I know would love to have been here today. Ronnie covered all the wonderful, wonderful people, including Juliet's daughter, who we did not mention, who cared and loved her as if she were their own mother. And her wonderful friends, the Werners, and Lori, who isn't present, mentally anymore and all of her other yeah sally and al and i forgive me oh for sure lenny mactus and all the other florida group that they enjoyed so dearly as well as a lot of our old friends who had the fortune of having a relationship with both my in-laws but would truly love you to know that they are here virtually. The Schlosses, the Vogels, the Weisses, the Goldbergs, the Cathy's, and I'm probably forgetting more. But everybody is with you today, and I just wanted you to know that. I mentioned them. For almost 50 years, my mother-in-law has been a part of my life. I can honestly say that there were a handful of times where we might not have seen eye to eye, but we always said our peace and continued to love one another. Watching her go through the tragic loss of my sister-in-law, the death of my father-in-law, and enduring her own health challenges was so painful for me to watch. That might have been the only consolation of being stricken with Alzheimer's disease. As it progressed, 
her unbearable losses became dulled by her fading memory. We lost our old relationship, but established a new one, taking care of her needs, giving her her the love and attention that she so deserved. She always gave so selflessly. We still continued to laugh with her as she never lost her sense of humor. She continued her paperwork by scribbling on scrap paper, our newfound card game of matching the numbers. And although this too became more infrequent as time passed, one thing that remained until the end was our dancing together. She never lost her rhythm and passion when the music played. We had a lot of laughs throughout the years and I will always cherish our relationship. I learned so much from her. And although there was barely a flicker of light left, I believe she felt our love and hoped that it made her feel less frightened in the daily confusion that cluttered her mind. I will miss you terribly with much love, Lauren. Debbie? <clears throat> Well, first of all, Mom, on all your amazing trips to Paris with Dad and Ron and Lauren to go shopping for Lorna, I put on this old Claire coat that you brought back to knock off at the uh, factory. So I hope you like it. Mom, you asked me to call you that when Hal and I first got engaged. You were shopping for our registry and you said, please call me Mom. But if we are ever together with your mom, then she, of course, is Mom. I then said to you, okay, mom, but if we are together with my own mom, then she will be mommy and you will be mom. We both smiled and proceeded to shop, which you did so well. The first time we met was at your home. You came in from a lunch in bar mitzvah with a leopard blouse and a brown leather skirt. And I thought to myself, wow, she's cool and a great dresser. And then you proceeded to show me your newly built closet, or should I say, room of color-coded clothes, and I totally understood. Yes, you were the queen of shopping, and we all benefited from your good taste and relationships with all the stores. You always had a way of getting things that you wanted. You were the one who called me when Hal and I initially broke up and said, don't worry, Deb. Hal doesn't know what he's doing. Things will work out. I know that you're the one. It's not over until the fat lady sings meaning that you were gonna knock some sense into them. Fast forward, it was time for us to buy a house. Well, you know, not really because we were just newly married and we had no kids, but dad had a relationship with a banker who gave him a list of foreclosures in Bergen County. You only wanted us to be close by. I, not knowing New Jersey at all, I had no idea of all the different towns. You said, let's pick a day and drive by all these foreclosures and see what there is. I took off a Wednesday from work, and we started up in Upper Saddle River, weaving through the towns, Woodcliffe Lake, Rivervale, Polworth, Tenafly, Englewood Cliffs. The list was vast. Nothing of interest, and we headed back to your house in Alpine. But right before we got to the turn up close to Dock Road, you pointed down the street and said, I wonder what's down that street. I pass it all the time. Let's go see. Well, in your Madeline way, there was no for sale sign on any of the eight homes on this small pebble country light road. We saw a woman putting out her trash cans. You rolled down the window and said, which house is the one that's for sale on this block? To our surprise, the woman said, oh, it's that one over there. We were like, what? Oh my God, there's a house for sale on this street? Again, only as you could, you said, come on. We got out of the car and we rang the doorbell. An old Korean woman, Jewish, uh, uh, old Korean woman came to the door, not speaking one word of English. We kind of finally figured out that it was her daughter who owned the house, and she was away and would be returning a few days later. We came back, and then the rest is history. The home we live in raised our family, shared holidays and life milestones we have today because you were curious and opened your mouth. And then, of course, you brought in Larry Mine as well Stern, and the building began. Fast forward again, Marty was 16 months old and Corey's Chris. I dressed Marty every day with a headband though, and you would say, isn't that squeezing her head? 
Needless to say, you did not like the bows. I went into Marty's room and it was time for the bris to start. She was all dressed in her little outfit and of course the bow. When I came in, you and Jody were in the room. I said, wait, where's the bow? You casually replied, I don't know, maybe it fell off. Jody, then all of nine years old, said, Grandma, you just took it off. Well, we all laughed and moved on, and I put the bow back on Marty's head. We spent lots of Sundays together, just you and me, and then you, me, and the kids. Hal would go over in the early days to do self rule reports with Dad, and then football Sundays with the bedding. You and I both hated the bedding. Dad would make Leo's, and we would do whatever. We shared lots of dinners at Bonagusto, your favorite frozen yogurt with vanilla with chocolate sprinkles, and you would eat Oreos for breakfast out of a tin can in your kitchen. Who does that? Then there were the times that you would take us to screenings of movies at the Meyersons, giant-sized candy bars and popcorn. But the most important gift you've given to me was of being my referee. You always had my back with Hal. We went through difficult... We went through very difficult patches. And it was always you who would straighten him out. Always wanted peace in the home. I'm so sorry to admit that you were needed a lot, especially in the early days. What would I have done without you? <laughs> Thankfully, you were always there and Hal listened to your advice. We shared sad times too. Your tongue cancer with your scar on your neck. You, ma you managed to make it chic by wearing beautiful scarves to cover the scar until you finally felt ready to leave the house without one. Debbie's illness, dad's passing, you were strong. With all of us by your side, we somehow managed to muddle through. I hope and pray that you are now back in dad's arms with Debbie and you are playing bridge and dad is calling you his dummy and you are all eating Debbie's famous macaroni and cheese. I love you. At this time, we're now going to hear from some of the grandchildren. Jamie and Adam. Uh, Jamie and Adam, right? But they they go together. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so Jamie and Adam, if you can hear me, you're unmuted. I'm going to spotlight your video. I'm going to ask you to speak at this time. Okay. Can you tell if they're talking? Okay, yeah. All right, so I am Jamie, and I am it's a word that is defined the last five weeks. It is a word that shapes the vision of the foreseeable future. And today, as I digest the news of my grandma's death, I realize that over the past five years, I have been watching the distance grow between the grandma I loved so much for so long and the grandma that this horrible disease left in its wake. It has been years since I've seen my grandmama, who loved shopping and spoiling those she loved, who worried that we would be too cold if we didn't bring a sweater to dinner, who loved to hear and tell a good dirty joke, who found such joy in seeing and felling over her children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren, who never wanted you to knock yourself out and would do anything to make your life easier and better. And yet, while that grandma hasn't existed for quite some time, it was that grandma whose hand I held when I would visit her. And despite the distance of her mind, I felt a closeness in my heart and a connection somewhere deep in her eyes. I could feel her love for me and hope she could feel mine for her. Watching her decline over the last few years has been heartbreaking. It was as if more and more of who she was got locked away inside her frail body unable to break free. She progressively struggled to communicate whatever it was she was thinking and feeling. Finally, she has given up that struggle, and I envision her in a better place where she is free again. She is reunited with Gramps and Aunt Debbie, and she is telling jokes and laughing, and without a doubt, looking down on all of us with a protective eye. She is in a place where all her frustration and mental bondage is now a distant memory. As I mourn her loss, I know I need to extend the generosity with which she showered me my entire life 
and be happy for her and the reclaimed freedom of her spirit. I will carry that spirit with me forever. I love you, Grandmama. Matthew, I think would be next. Beautiful. Now I'm going to turn to Matthew, and I'm going to spotlight the video on you, Matthew, and ask Great. you to please share some words. Thank you. Grandma, it was so hard to see you these past few years, knowing that you were not you. Watching you suffer was heartbreaking. I know you are now in a better place with Grandpa, but I do miss you very much. I'm so thankful that I have so many memories to draw upon your wit, sense of humor, especially your dirty jokes. Your generosity and love always left me wanting more time with you. You drive your happiness in making your loved ones happy. You were masterful at planning the little things that made me so happy as a child. Whenever you would pick me, pick me up from mom and dad's house, you would tell me to get in the front seat. And then we would, when we were both in the car, you would lean over and say, you don't have to wear a seatbelt with me. I'm very careful. <laughs> I'm such a... Not such a great move in hindsight, but I loved every minute of those car rides. I'll never forget when you and Grandpa showed up unannounced at our house with a large TV for my room. My parents were furious, but you were playfully dismissive and managed to convince them to leave it alone, and that it meant a lot for you, lot to you for me to have it, as you winked at me. You always knew how to deliver the perfect gift. I always loved going out to dinner with you and Grandpa, whether it was Chinese, Japanese, or Italian, there was one constant. We never ended up sitting at the first table that was offered to us. <laughs> it was always a negotiation with the hostess or the waiter. You either dismissed the first table quickly, or you would wait until we sat down, realize that the table next to us was too loud, and then request a table change. You were a negotiator at heart, and I love that about you. And perhaps my favorite memory from childhood was the night we all had together at the El Dorado Casino in Puerto Rico. <laughs> Grandpa was in his element at the craps table, and we all hovered around to try our luck. It was bleak until you took the dice and proceeded to roll for almost an hour. I have a vivid memory of you and Grandpa shouting back and forth to each other. That's a number. <laughs> you were incredible, confident and calm, which is how I remember you throughout my life. And even, even though the, the last few years were harder, you still managed to dance. I cherish every dance I had with you. I just wish I could rewind the clock <coughs> 15 years and have another one with you. That being said, I realize how lucky I was to have you in my life. And the memories that you, you've given me are forever. I love you and miss you so much. Now go play some, cramp, some, some crops with Gramps. Love you. Robin. Now Robin. Her audio and ask Robin to now share some words. Thank you. <coughs> as soon as I heard that my grandma passed away, my mind tried to fill up with thoughts and memories of my grandma before she had Alzheimer's. Before the time when it felt like she was already gone. I have so many memories, and yet I couldn't quite land on one. I was struggling to be able to really see her the way I wanted to remember her for long enough to feel the comfort that I was seeking. I wanted so badly to remember her and honor her and all that her life meant, and I couldn't quite seem to grasp it. And then it hit me at a moment when I wasn't expecting. I was drying my hair and thinking, there's probably no point of straightening my hair right now. I should just throw it up in a bun. But it felt sort of relaxing, and I knew I'd feel better if I did it. And I found myself thinking about how my grandma would have definitely, adamantly seen the point of me straightening my hair. And, wouldn't, and it wouldn't have mattered if it was for any reason at all. And I smiled thinking of her. And I realized in that moment that I wasn't just seeing her in her earlier years and remembering the way she would comment on my hair when it wasn't blown out. I was actually picturing her in the very last phase of her life with her makeup and jewelry and beautified hair, thanks to her loving caregivers. And it hit me, there she was, right in front of me always. I was missing the point completely. The idea that I could reduce her memory to a finite period of her life was ridiculous. 
because those earlier memories were just a part of her journey, just as her final years were only a small part of it. Those harder, scarier, and lonelier years. The years where I didn't call or visit as much as I could have, and as much as I wish I had. No, sorry. no one period of time can accurately define her life, and I hate what Alzheimer's took away from her and our family. I really thought I wanted to forget the end, but upon her death, I now feel like I can see my grandma in her final stage of life with so much more clarity than I could while she was alive. I wish so badly that I embraced this short part of her life with more acceptance and presence while she was here. So today, I wanna to remember and appreciate my grandma's life in its entirety, even though it brings a little more sadness and pain. My grandma was beautiful, funny, smart, business savvy, a skilled shopper, a great card player, a woman who loved and cherished her family and friends, and probably the best dirty joke teller I ever knew. She really loved a good laugh and always enjoyed dancing. I can still hear her saying, hi sugar, and I can feel the love and pride she had about her grandchildren. She always told me how much she believed in me and encouraged me to see my capabilities at the level she saw them. I will cherish the vivid memories I have of collecting leaves in Woodstock and using rubber cement to glue them into our leaf book. Learning card games, eating junk, swimming in the pool, playing tennis, rubbing Buddha's belly, playing with the duck phone, and relaxing in the ginormous gray chairs are only some of the highlights of the time I spent with my grandparents in Alpine. These and many other memories will stay with me forever. I am so grateful that I was on the receiving end of my grandma's abundant love for 38 years. I truly hope that she felt my equal, unconditional love for her always. Grandma, it is my pleasure to have had 38 years physically with you, and it will indeed be my pleasure to hold you in my heart and mine for the rest of my life. Give Grandpa a big hug and kiss and know that you will be missed but never forgotten. Thank you. We're now going to turn it to Jody Sherman. We're going to spotlight your video and take you off mute. Okay, Jody. Okay. Hey, Sugar. What's happening? I can still hear Grandma's voice on the other end of the line like it was yesterday. When I think about her, I don't see these past eight years, but rather the Grandma that was significantly fuller, wearing her silky shirts and slacks with a thin belt, full face of makeup, hair recently blown out by Julie, smelling of perfume. I picture her getting ready in her Alpine bathroom as I sat talking to her and playing with her Clinique makeup. We're listening to The Phantom of the Opera or Frank Sinatra, and I feel totally at peace. Anyone in the family can probably attest to her famous phrase, want to go chopping, said with a little twinkle in her eye. No matter how many times I would say, I came to see you and not go shopping, she would say, yeah, yeah, but we can do both. When I got my license, one of my favorite and most frequent stops would be to their house. Grandpa was usually playing cards at Edgewood, but Grandma would say, he'll be home in 10 minutes if I tell him you're here. He never made it back in 10 minutes, but we used to sit in the kitchen and talk while we waited for him to get home. The visits weren't long, but they were meaningful and always ended with both of them walking me to my car and waving as I drove away. As I got older, I was able to reflect on these visits and felt so fortunate that I took advantage of living only 20 minutes away. Grandma had a hilarious sense of humor and loved a dirty joke like no other. She would say, want to hear a joke? And immediately my mom would interject, uh, I don't know, is it appropriate? Most of the time she would chuckle and refrain from telling me, but every now and then she couldn't help herself. She was a rule breaker, funny, fashionable, generous, and loving, and made me feel like the luckiest girl to have her as my grandma. Not a day went by that I didn't feel her love and support throughout my life. Grandma, I love you and already miss you more than you know. Enjoy Gramps' eggs and bialis. Keep on dancing, shopping, telling dirty jokes, and rolling that lucky seven. Hugs and kisses. Thank you all for those beautiful sentiments. I hope that you can see the family 
and the grave at this time. I'm going to stand before you. Thanks for all of your patience as we work through this new normal and commemorating the loss of life through technology. One end can say how terribly empty and sad it is. The other, we can give blessings for the technology that allows us all to be closer together at times like this. I had the blessing of knowing Madeline and dancing with her at Simcha's, like Corey's bar mitzvah, like Tara's bat mitzvah. And we cried in this very spot. When Debbie died, when Elliot died, that was the nature of our relationship. One where we shared laughter and where we shared tears. The one thing that was incredibly clear though about Madeline was she knew how to love. And if you were blessed to be in her circle of love, you felt that embrace of her love. My relationship has been with Debbie and Hal for many, many years. And to see how she would always look after her baby like a mother over a protective little cub who often would get into mischief, even as an adult. But that mother would always be there to stand by your side and love you and protect you was something maternal, unique, and uncanny. And it taught me a lot about life. It taught me a lot about how it is that we love. And it always reminded me of her goodness and the strength that she probably doubted she had in herself, but overwhelmed everyone with that she showed whenever she was faced with a challenge. I want to share a brief teaching with all of you. I'm going to put this down. That I think not only puts into perspective the death of Madeline, but also this terrible pandemic that all of us are dealing with in COVID-19. Our tradition tells us that the holiest thing that we have as a people is the Torah scroll. It's something that we read from three times a week. We stand when we're in its presence. We adorn it with velvet and silver. And we touch it. We dance around it. We hold it up. It has to be written by hand. If that's mistakes, we take it out. There's 613 commandments that are found inside that Torah scroll. But today, in New Jersey, in New York, in California, in Israel, all over the world, we can't have access to the Torah scroll. We can't read actually from the scroll. And if we do, we're doing it individually without a minion. We can't stand in front of it. We most certainly can't kiss it because of the contagious nature of kissing and sharing. So does that mean that during the COVID pandemic that there's no Shabbat to observe, that there's no holidays to keep, that we no longer have to treat our neighbor as we would treat ourselves, that it's now permissible to put a stumbling block in front of the blind? Of course not. The Torah is the tangible part that we touch and we kiss. But what the Torah stands for is far beyond that which we can touch and we can kiss. And so too it is with Madeline. We are going to miss all the parts of her that she had when God gave her all of her faculties. The ability to shop, her funny quips, the great dirty jokes, the way that she would absolutely spoil her grandkids, almost to piss off her par their parents more than just <laughs> spoiling the grandkids. We're gonna miss her way, her sweetness, her goodness. I saw her last year when sadly parts of her mind were not totally in her control. But what was still inert for her, what still was a reflex for her, was her sweetness and her goodness. She wasn't mean or belligerent, she was loving and kind. And when we incorporate those pieces, when we pick up the dice at a craps table, when you decide as a family to all get together for a barbecue or go on a cruise or a vacation when it becomes acceptable and permissible to do that again, when you with your own grandchildren and great-grandchildren spoil them and love them and adore them and tell them your own dirty jokes, you're going to keep her memory alive and you're going to pay honor to her memory. 
And what you realize is that the physical part of her will be laid to rest. But the part of Madeline that was quintessentially this amazing soul of mother, grandmother, great-grandmother, wife, that can never, ever be taken from you. That will live with you and with all of us forever. Madeline, as your grandchildren so beautifully said, we pray that you are back in Elliot's arms, that you are with Debbie and you are looking after all of us, that you rest in the peace in which you deserve. And we promise to look after your loved ones here in this world and will always protect that in your absence. <laughs> May God Amen. bless you. May God keep you. May you always look after us. Amen. Amen. Because of COVID-19, we don't hand shovels one to the next. Al and Debbie brought a shovel from their house that they will use for themselves. I brought disposable cups that Lauren, Ronnie, and I will use to put earth in the grave. We're doing this not only symbolically, but on behalf of every single one of you and your households that I know would form an enormous line here to pay homage and tribute to Madeline and the way in which she lived. As we put the earth in, we'll not only say one of the prayers, but we'll say our own personal prayer and meditation. And as we do, we invite all of you to invoke your prayer and meditation as well. So. so if you're taking a cup, there's four, and you just... Take one as it is. I'll do the first Cousin Jed and his family, Cousin Nancy and his family, all the cousins on the Satnik side, my mother's friends in Florida, my mother's friends from Edgewood, all my friends with all the support.
wish Corey was here to help me do this. Now I'm going to recite the memorial prayer, followed by the Kaddish prayer. El Malei Rachamim, Shochem Bameromim, Hametzeh Menucha Nechona, Tacha Kempei Ashkina, Bemalok Kedoshi Mutahorim, Kizar Harakia Masirim, Et Nishmat Mindel Batshuel Bachaya. Shalcha leolama, began Eden te menuchata. Ana bala rachamim, as ti reha beseter, kina pecha leolamim. Utsaror, bitaror, hachaim, and nishpata. Arona yur nachalata, betanuacha mishkama vishalam, minamar ame. Yamale rachamim, exalted and compassionate God. Grant infinite rest in your sheltering presence among the holy and among the pure to the soul of Madeline Sadnik, who has gone to her eternal home. Merciful one, we ask that our loved ones find perfect peace in your eternal embrace. May her soul be bound in the bond of life eternal. And may she forever rest in the peace in which she deserves. And let us together say, Amen. 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 We're going to recite the Kaddish prayer. Yit Gadal, Yit Gadash, Shemei Rava, Be'ama Divra Chirute, Be'am Lich Malchute, Be'chaye Chon, Uriyome Chon, Uv'chaye Dechol Beit Yisrael, Ba'agala, Uv'izman Kari, Be'imru Amein. Yehei Shemei Rava, Mivarach, Le'olam, Le'olmei Amaya, Yiparach, V'yishtabach, V'yipoar, V'yitromam, V'yitnasei. Vietadar, Vietale, Vietalal, Shemeda Kudisha, Rifu, Le Ela, Minkol, Birchata, Bishirata, Tushbechata, Benechamata, the Amiram Beama, Vimru, Amen. Ye Shlama Rabba, Minshemaya, Bechaim, Alenu, Vialko Yisrael, Vimru, Amen. O Seshalom, Mirama, Uya Seshalom, Alenu, Vialko Yisrael, Vimru, Amen. You can all repeat these words after me for those of you following along at home. Hamakom, Yinachem, Etchem, Betoch, Sha'ar, Avlei, Zion, Yerushalayim. May God comfort you amongst all mourners of Zion and Jerusalem. May you know of no sadness anymore. May the memory of your mother, your grandmother, your great grandmother always be a blessing and an inspiration. And may you find comfort amongst your friends, your family, and your community that stand with you at this time. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our service for today. There will be a virtual Shiva Minion at 6.30 p.m. For those of you who need the link, please be in touch with anyone from Debbie and Hal or Ronnie and Lauren's family. We will share the link with you. It should also be on the Temple website. Please be safe, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.